get put under the microscope. I don't understand how the skin suit that the lizard people wear should be allowed to distinguish people whatsoever. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ewan. And I'm Sean. And welcome to The Abyss. So yeah, I, I, we had some feedback on episode zero. I specifically had quite a bit of feedback on episode you zero. You did. Um, so I was privy to said feedback and, and it was wonderful. Oh uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think that there's a somewhat of a misunderstanding in that I are you, might... Are you issuing a retraction? No, 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 no. I might misrepresent my own opinion for the sake of entertainment value. Well, yeah. I'm not necessarily just an idiot or a monster. And I want that to be clear. Well, if I say something stupid, it's always a deliberate decision for the entertainment of the listener. Well, no, 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 no. You say it's always a deliberate decision. If I'm I say sure something you can... stupid, you think to yourself, would you would really think that? No, that's ridiculous. It must be. Perhaps. But do bear in mind, dear listeners, that Ewan is not infallible and he does have some opinions that just, just, just are. Well, they're just wrong, frankly. I, I, I disagree with Sean, and I would describe that as slanderous. Um, <laughs> hence why it won't be making it onto the podcast. Oh, come on. <laughs> We're starting by doing a general rundown of all the things we miss, I think. Are we not? We could do, yeah. That's. I quite like that idea, actually. So has Theresa May done anything interesting? Um, no. Not hey, really, Has no. Jeremy Corbyn done anything interesting? He was accused of being an anti-Semite a lot. We missed out on Jeremy Corbyn being... Yeah, Labour get accused of being anti-Semites constantly. At the moment, So yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say that's particularly interesting. I'm sure we'll have to fight about that um, at some other point. What else? Donald Trump's been Donald Trump, I guess. Donald Trump has been Donald Trump in... If you want to read about... All the way. North Korea. Um, Sean has written an excellent piece of written content for you on the blog... I have indeed. Which you can find at www.thepoliticalabyss.com which, slash the blog. Which, if you hadn't already had this drilled into you in episode zero, is our brand spanking new website. Call Blimey Gov. Yes. <laughs> um, what else has happened? Spain ousted their Prime Minister. Spain did oust their Prime Minister yesterday, so this is very recent news. Brexit's been Brexit. Brexit um, has been Brexiting. Yeah, uh, the, uh, it's one of those things that we don't really have much. David Davis is turned up to the meetings with nothing but a pencil yeah. and a distinct sense of British superiority, I would imagine. I think Boris Johnson screwed up quite a few times since we've last spoke. Anything outside of the world of politics we need to talk about? Harvey Weinstein got arrested. He did. That's quite Harvey good. Weinstein did get arrested. Um, Morgan Freeman is currently going through a scandal of his own. Oh, really? Yeah. He also, just last week, was announced that he has recorded the voiceover announcements for the Vancouver transit system. So if you're on the underground in Vancouver, Morgan Freeman will tell you what the next stop is and where you need to get off. Which I'm sure sounded like a brilliant idea up until the point where he managed to be accused of sexual assault. Yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Any other major things? Uh, there was one. There's the wedding, remember. but we are going to touch oh, on yeah. that later. Yeah, well, it, well, it's worth mentioning. Well, there we're going to touch on it again later, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, there has been a royal wedding. Um, Sean and I played the game of does you and know who any of these people on the television are? No, I couldn't name any of them besides the Queen and the last two that got married. I still remember Will and Kate. Do you know what their titles are? They're... Duke and Duchess of Derby. Cambridge. Cambridge. I like yeah. Cambridge. Wow. Okay. Uh, so yes, we will be touching on that later and I might if set I up made, a... If you had to be made Duke of somewhere, where would you pick? Cambridge, right? It's gorgeous. Yeah. Maybe, Possibly. maybe Devon. I like, I'd, I'd go for Devon. Possibly. Greater Manchester. <laughs> Slough <laughs> Duke of Milton Keynes <laughs> But to start off with um, We're going to talk about a news story That I wrote about the other day And thought, cool blimey That's really exciting And then didn't read anything about anywhere Because I didn't hear anybody report on it 
partly because it's not something that's going to come into effect for about two, three years, and not something that will affect very many people at that time, but maybe in a decade could be quite important. Described by Theresa May as the biggest change in technical education in over 70 years, the T levels which are being introduced, or the first colleges to offer T levels have been announced starting in 2020 and 2021, and they will be providing three different courses. Courses in construction, digital and education. Yeah, so it looks like the sentence doesn't make sense when you read it. I had to read it like four times. It's construction, yeah, digital, yeah, and education and welfare or something like that. Education and childcare. Yeah, so this is why we need the Oxford comma. Yeah, you would. <laughs> I uh, disagree with you. So you know how we had apprenticeships and BTECs, and those were supposed to be the technical vocational skills that you could get to go into a lot of fields. Yeah. Or if you want to do it at a higher level, you can take engineering or science courses at universities. In the face of a looming Brexit, where our workforce will be, well, part of the government's Brexit strategy is to essentially become more industrially autonomous because we won't have as much trade with Europe and that requires high skilled capable individuals in fields like software development computers general engineering electrical engineering but the problem is that that's great we want a whole bunch of really good engineers let's send them to university ah Brexit's pretty soon actually like actually like very soon yeah and like a university course that's like that's like three years okay um and really, really expensive. So what we have to do is have some way to get a whole bunch of engineers without sending them to university. We develop the T-level, a technical equivalent to the A-level. You can walk out of education at the age of 18 with a qualification that gave you a work placement and a supposedly enough skills to be practising in a field. Amusingly, however... Uh, you make the point about how soon Brexit is arriving, and that's a valid point. If we, even if now we decided we need loads more engineers and sent them all to university, they would graduate two or three years after Brexit took place. Yeah, yeah. but this is the thing. You go. The three T levels that we have already discussed will start being taught in September 2020, yeah. a year after Brexit, and the rest of the courses, uh, 22 further subjects covering finance and accounting engineering and manufacturing and creative and design will be rolled out in 2021 yeah three years no two years will be rolled out two years after brexit has taken place so there's not that much difference no, but you couldn't do any course that you're introducing is going to have to have some period of time developing this is being developed with a bunch of uh, large companies that are based inside of the uk like rolls royce for instance is involved in one of the engineering ones. And so you, you, it's going to take you a couple of years to write your specification and come up with a decent thing. So even if there were new university courses, they wouldn't be rolled out till 2020. Do you think the, they've been working on this since They've been working the on it since 2016. Okay, fair enough. You couldn't start much earlier than 2020. Even if it was university courses, you'd still have some period of time that you'd have to wait for. The difference between this and... A university course is that oh wait we've made thousands of new opportunities for uh, graduates of a with a levels to start at university oh well less of half less than half of people do a levels okay so we've limited our pool of people to people who did well enough to do a levels and then who aren't already going to university and who are going to be good at engineering whereas the t level is supposed to target and fast track people who aren't necessarily going to university, but are still technically minded. It, are the T levels going to replace B techs, or are they? I definitely think it's more of an alternative to an apprenticeship than it is to a B tech, because they're being rolled out in specifically technical fields, whereas yeah. B techs can be in a much much broader range of things. But it's the argument I think I made it before back in the old days of the podcast that uh, preferential treatment for engineering students is something that is essential yeah. post-Brexit. Um, it, it should be no surprise that there are changes being made to uh, the education system post-Brexit. I, I think this is a good change. 
um, I look forward to having a flick through the specs when they get released for certain subjects. And um, as you say, I will be very interested to see how they cope with the work placement issue. One possible solution to the work placement issue would have been to send a certain amount of students to the continent to do their work placements. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible. Did you ever do work experience? I did do work experience. Yes. Did you find it to be useful? Because I never had a work experience thing at school. Uh, the first time I started working in industry, which is often the phrase they use when yeah. talking about work with um, alongside education, was when I left sixth form and got a job. Yeah, I, I went to work with uh, a friend of ours who works at the British Embassy in Vienna for a while, which was lovely and very interesting, but it was not through normal channels. Was it useful then? It was very useful, yes. And uh, it's an experience that I do regularly draw on um, as part of my degree now. If you're lucky enough to have a work placement of any kind and of any length, because mine was quite short, in the industry that you then find yourself studying for or working in, it is invariably going to be useful to you. I have a number of friends who do software um, or computer programming or computer science degrees, um, and they always say that they learn more in the two months that they spend with a company over the summer than they did in their entire first year. Yeah. With technical subjects especially, obviously an embassy is... is an application of your degree in many ways, yeah. but at the same time, not technical in the same way. It's, no, so I, it's not an industry. It's mm, a politics uh, and diplomacy is peculiar and somewhat set apart from everything yeah. else as it is. Um, yeah, so it, you don't apply the principles that you've learnt during your education in the same way. Yeah. In the social sciences, you tend to spend a lot more time learning how to think and how to approach problems rather than the definitive solutions to things. Clearly, never study maths or computer science. I have studied maths, as you well know. Well, that's surely the only thing that you learn in maths is modes uh, of thinking. <sighs> yes, that is a fair point. It's a different way of thinking. Yeah, a so. softer, fluffier mode of thinking. Right, let's not go back <laughs> onto this fluffy thing. I don't want this to become a trope, right? <laughs> every science student, every um, computer science engineering student I know does some kind or tries to fight to get a position in some kind of um, a summer of placement people, or year in industry, yeah, something like that. I've heard a lot of people say that actually um, for those sorts of subjects, the year in industry or however long is by far and away the most vital part. I've learned more in the... The main group I've heard say that are medical professionals and doctors. That doesn't surprise me at all. Who say after, what is it, seven years, I think it is, in this country of studying, their first day in a hospital as not a student is still terrifying and there's stuff... Stuff still comes to them that they don't know even after all these seven years of studying... Largely because, and this applies to engineering and all of the technical jobs, even where people's lives aren't necessarily at risk. You might know all of the problems and you might be, know the solutions for all of the problems, but you definitely won't have seen all the different ways in which the problem can express itself. Yeah. And that is what industry is really useful for. I think that the difficulty the T-levels will have, and the reason why I'm sceptical about it, is I think that the work placements for the test run the pilot the one that they're going to show off about um afterwards that would be fine i think yeah i think um that's not an issue um i also think that uh, i think that it might be difficult to convince students to go oh oh you would you were going to do an a level or you're going to go get an apprenticeship something like that how about instead you try this experimental new form of education which Five out of six businesses say that they do not understand what it means to have a T-level. So when you then go to apply to a job which wasn't with the company that you did your work placement for, you might end up looking like you've got absolutely no qualifications. Was the five out of six companies thing a genuine statistic? Yep, it's, uh, there was a City and Guild yeah. did a uh, poll of... I can't Army. remember however many businesses, I think a hundred and something. It's be in the show notes, so 
I don't have to okay. uh, bluff my way through yeah. remembering stats at the top of my head. And the, their problem was the fact that, oh, that's really great. You developed an entirely new specification by which I'm supposed to try and interpret how good this person is at a certain thing. Mm-hmm. The only other, the main other issue, I think, will be the fact that who's going to teach a T-level? Because the difficulty with it is the fact that it's still got a classroom element. Sixty percent um, of your time, at least, is. If it's got a classroom element, I don't think that will be an issue. Um, well, the issue before is, before is these are people who aren't doing A levels, so they're not suited to the classroom element. And all technical teachers have to be really good at their subject. And there are a lot of places in the UK where your computer science or engineering teachers used to work in those fields twenty years ago. And are now there might be a an issue with teaching. It is worth pointing out that whilst it's not ideal, technical subjects can can be taught by generally qualified teachers. There will be a shortage of technical teachers who have worked in the industry. So I fear that some classes will have to settle. For teachers who are qualified to teach and have and have had to essentially learn the spec along with their students. And it's also important to point out that the reason why we're hearing about the T-levels is because BTECs were tried as a thing and that, whilst popular, didn't yield much no. in terms of development. And then the Tories made a big stab at making apprenticeships a thing and that fell flat on its face. Well, I don't think it did. I, I would have to disagree with that. Apprenticeships did relatively well they were good for the people who did them nobody did them i'll link in the show notes again to some um, statistics about the number of people who take apprenticeships i don't know if the the t-levels are going to completely replace the apprenticeship system i hope they don't i do think that the apprenticeship system regardless of how few people take it should stick around and i actually think that the number of people seeking out apprenticeships will probably start to go up do you think that a um a t-level is essentially just a inferior apprenticeship an apprenticeship is say it was a three-year apprenticeship and a well, two-year apprenticeship and a two-year course to a t-level uh, the t-level gives you um, three months working in industry and a bunch of time sat in the classroom and an apprenticeship gives you two years working in industry and as we've discussed you'll learn more working in industry than you will in the classroom yeah i i have to admit Certainly when it comes to the really technical subjects, I'm not sure that the T-levels are going to add anything. I think perhaps it would have been more useful to to push apprenticeships a little bit more. But the issue there is that when they released the uh, apprenticeship scheme and rolled it out, they pushed it hard. Yeah. And clearly that hasn't been working. So I would, the government are caught between a rock and a hard place in that if... Somebody who has done an apprenticeship in industry will would be, in my opinion, and likely in the opinion of future employers, better qualified. They have more ex- actual hands-on experience of a hands-on profession. But given the low uptake of apprenticeships, I suppose T-levels are the next best thing. If you want to be the most valuable member of the workforce, if you want to get a job that contributes loads, will have a whole bunch of government funding, and you'll definitely walk into a job post-Brexit... Do an engineering degree. Yeah. Uh, we're all thank you for it. <laughs> yes, definitely. Just do your A-levels, go do your engineering degree, and the world will love you. Rounding it off with a nice bit of friendly advice. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as you may have noticed, a couple of weeks ago, there was a royal wedding. There was. Did you watch it? I did not see any of it. I did. It was very nice. V- very very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, not my cup of tea, but... One of the main players in the wedding, some may say the most influential character there, um, was called Meghan Markle. She was, yeah. Uh, although she is now called... The bride. She is now called Meghan Windsor? No, she's called the Duchess of Sussex. The Duchess of Suffolk... Sussex. Sussex. The Duchess of... The Dutch... <laughs> are you all right? Are you are you feeling okay? Oh, um, the Duchess of Sussex, uh, her, her Majesty 
no, 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 no. Only the sovereign is okay. His or her Majesty. But is she Windsor now? I don't believe so. No. Is she her, Mrs. Her, her Sussex? Ti- her, ti- her title is Meghan Duchess of Sussex. And yes, uh, you can refer to dukes and duchesses by the name of their area. So she's Mrs. Sussex. So Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Sussex or Meghan the Duchess of Sussex. All right, but it's really not that complicated. Okay, but in in the newspapers, she is still referred to as Meghan Markle. She is, despite the fact that she's now part of the royal family. Yes, I don't know if this has been the case in previous people marrying into the royal family. I think. Um, uh, what was the name of the last one? Kate something. Kate Middleton. We still call her Kate Middleton, wouldn't we? I suppose lots of people would call the Duchess of Cambridge. Most do call her the Duchess of Cambridge. Yes. Interesting. Regardless, that's not the point. So this woman... Just, sorry, sorry, I have to say this. In case you haven't noticed, and for those of you that have been listening to the podcast for a while, you will already know this, but for anyone new, Ewan knows nothing about the royal family. I've been able to competently carry myself through this conversation. He is, he is a Briton. He has lived here all his life, as far as I'm aware. Correct. And he has somehow managed to avoid learning the names or roles of any of the royal family. Our queen is called Elizabeth. Apart from the queen, and frankly, if you didn't know who the The queen was, you must have lived under a rock. Yes, the second. There we go. I believe he knows who Prince William and Kate are simply because the wedding was quite a big deal. That one was, yeah. I was more Um, angry about that one as well. One of the earlier episodes, I mentioned Prince Philip, and your response is, which one is that? Is he the husband or the son of the Queen? He is the husband of the Queen. I was close, wasn't I? Meghan Markle's an actress? She was. Isn't anymore? No. Do you really think that a royal family as grand and as steeped in tradition as the British one would let one of their number remain an actress? What she so in this article I was reading about how influential she was. She's been branded a feminist, yes. political activist. Yes. Why could she not still be? It's a fair question. I will grant you that. Uh, in Suits, the show where Meghan Markle made her name, in a number of episodes, she has engaged in what we shall tastefully call risque scenes, involving less than royal clothing. What? I did not know any of this. Yeah. Most people won't mind, but Meghan is certainly an anomaly in royal history. I suppose this is why she's being branded a feminist. Her body of work... That's... (laughs) I, but... Does not (laughs) necessarily tally with what people might think of as the traditional values of the royal family. Or indeed, what the royal family may think of as the traditional values of the royal family. Hence... Why she has had to give up her career. If she were, say, a Shakespearean actor with the RSC, I imagine they might have left her alone. Do you know what Meghan Markle's done to be a feminist activist? Uh, I know that she has done a lot of charity work. Well, as I understand it, um, Harry and Meghan met whilst doing charity work. Ah. Wait, this is so uh, she is one of the 25 most influential. She is. I would argue that uh, she isn't. Yeah. And that she is, to some extent, culturally irrelevant. Yeah. Compared to almost everybody else on the list, some of whom I don't really know that much about. A lot of the, a lot of the elder women in the list who it's... have had important and influential careers in um, fields that I just don't follow. Um, and then some of the musicians and actresses, kind of cultural icons who I've heard of but don't really know. The Duchess of Sussex was also named one of the 100 most influential people in the world, I believe, earlier. There was a lot of talk around her as a choice for Harry. She is, as I said earlier, not what one would expect historically from the royal family for reasons that, frankly, are in, would be in any other area of democratic liberal society. Some of the reasons people were giving for Meghan being an odd choice for the royals would not be acceptable anywhere else. But because it's the royal family, the fact that she is not white, for example, um, that was something that was perfectly 
acceptable to discuss as being a, a what? peculiarity. What do you mean is it perfectly acceptable to discuss? It's not, but I'm saying it, it was discussed. When somebody becomes a royal, the normal rules sort of go out the window a little bit. So you're saying that, you, that, that if somebody had said to you, oh, isn't it odd, there's going to be a person of colour in the royal family, you would have thought that was an acceptable talking point? No. But you said the rules go out the window. I, I, I am saying the rules go out the window. I'm saying that the conversation was taking place. I don't agree with it. There's a lot of racist conversations that take place that don't get to be considered acceptable. The conversation was taking place in the mainstream media, which usually what? would get torn apart for this. And it didn't. It was a very civilised conversation, but it was an abominable one nonetheless. But my point is that when somebody becomes a royal, aspects of their character and their nature and their life, which usually would be protected by general liberal courtesy... But the fact that she wasn't white, the fact that she was a divorcee, the fact that she was an American, the fact that she was an actress, all of these things were brought up in the media somewhere as, if not issues, as being aspects of her that made her a new entity yeah. in royal circles. All of this information does make her seem more culturally relevant than I thought she was. Yeah. So... That is interesting. You've given me some new perspective on this. Do we think that having a list specifically of influential women serves a purpose? I think a lot of the women on the list can be considered role models, especially for younger women. Is Meghan Markle a role model for younger women? I don't know enough about her. To give you a, a bit of a background on uh, Meghan Markle, now Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. It says here... She was a counsellor for an international charity by the name of One Young World. She's attended summits for this group in 2014 and 16. She spoke on topics of gender equality and modern day slavery. Also in 2014, she took uh, travelled to Afghanistan and Spain as part of the United Service Organisation's chairman on, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In 2016, she became a global ambassador for World Vision Canada, travelling to Rwanda for the Clean Water Campaign. Um, she travelled to India to raise awareness for issues concerning women. She does have an impressive list. Yeah. Of... Returning from India, she penned an opt op ed for Time magazine concerning the situation of women in regard to menstrual health. She's also worked with the United Nations um, Entity for Gender Equality and in the Empowerment of Women as an advocate. Um, and then in 2018, she was included in Time's, Time magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. And obviously the list that we're discussing as well. So I would argue that she has gone above and beyond what you would usually expect from um, actors and actresses. And at the end of the day, all of the charity work she's done is, of course, amazing. But she is now a member of the royal family, which objectively does make her very influential. I mean, I hadn't really heard of her until, you know we've had this conversation i've learned more about her in the last 10 minutes than i had in the last several months so but no. that's just me i think we should probably wrap it up there there is one other thing are we not going to discuss that ruth davidson is on here ruth davidson this was the entire thrust of why i wanted to talk about this <laughs> and you've sidetracked me talking about this lizard okay <laughs> right you cannot call the royal family lizards, Ewan. It's, everyone knows it's a joke. Everyone knows it's a joke at this point. There is nobody in the world who doesn't know that... Treason! They're... Treason, <laughs> I tell you! But Ruth Davidson, a Tory MP, on a list of influential women. Ludicrous. Ridiculous. How on earth is this allowed to be the case? Well... She's a very accomplished MP. Part of the reason, I think, is because um, she is openly gay and is the leader of her faction of the Conservative Party. This is considered to be a very significant step forward in right-wing politics. The only leader of a Scottish political party who is not openly gay is Nicola Sturgeon. 
Is that actually true? Yes. Fantastic. Wow. It's yeah, not the point. She is, is not yeah, significant. No, but th- she is significant in that she is leading the Conservative Party. So this is the list of 25 most influential people to the readers of the Daily Mail. However, <laughs> regardless of her sexual orientation, she has a very good track record as an MP. You may not agree with her policies. I may not agree with her policies. But as I understand it, she has a very good track record as an MP and as a politician. She is well-liked. She is influential. I don't understand why she's on the list and not Diane Abbott or Mary Black, who is the youngest MP, but also part of the SNP, so Scottish. Or Diane Abbott, first black female MP, now... Home or shadow home secretary. That's not influential at all. No, see, you're. I think you're missing. The Yvette point. Cooper. I think you're missing the point of the list. A couple of the people you just mentioned, fair enough. But someone like Diane Abbott, uh, she has power, but she's not particularly influ- influential because she's not particularly well liked. She has said and done some things that have made her a lot of enemies and have made her quite unpopular. I don't think that Diane Abbott is responsible for people not liking Diane Abbott. I think Rupert Murdoch's responsible for people not liking Diane Abbott. Possibly. And I'm not going to deny that there will be certain media outlets that will be swung against her. However, she has expressed some questionable views in interviews on what I would consider to be relatively impartial media stations. I am often disgusted by the media's treatment of Diane Abbott and I think that she is more impressive and important than lots of people give her credit for. It appears that you we have found a topic that you and I disagree about as vehemently as we used to disagree about far more things. Regardless, I don't think Ruth Davidson is significant enough. Sure, she's well liked and she's a lesbian who's going to have a kid. That's, you know, if that's enough to be important, celebrated on a list of what should be role models to children when she's still the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, a fact that should be, there shouldn't be such a thing as the Scottish Conservative Party. She should not be on the list due to the Tories' track records on issues of female equality, of feminism, and of the way that they treat Scotland in their history. They have absolutely zero right. She has absolutely zero right to be on that list. I, I agree that there might Just be... her association with the I, Tories. No, 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 no. Sorry. Just because she is associated with a political party that you disagree with just does, she does, associ- not, does not limit her, her, her level of influence. Just because she's associated with one of the most notorious boys clubs in the country, one that is steeped in, uh, in misogynist sentiment... And don't give me for a second the fact that Theresa May as our Prime Minister changes any part of that. I wouldn't have done. But So just because she is connected to this group, and it's a large group... She's connected to a and she's also trying, misogynist group. She is also trying to change it. Her views are very progressive and she's done... She is still a Conservative, but as Conservative leaders go... She has pushed very hard for progressive movement. She has done some fantastic work that would fall far more in line with the views of people like you you and I than I think you're giving her credit for. Just because she's connected to a group who, yes, you are right, it's a boys club and they have done and continue to do some horrific things, does not mean that she is responsible for those horrific things. And if she is trying to change the image of her party, and if she is trying to do better than the rest of her party, surely that makes her even more worthy of accolades. It's the same argument that people put forward when they say that the current Pope is progressive. It's all very well progressive for the group of people that they're with. If it wasn't for the fact that their group of people is an outdated, bigoted, and ultimately unnecessary and destructive force in the world, then maybe I'd have some opinion that was positive of her. And please never, ever again assume that my politics would be in line with Ruth Davidson. 
If you think that's the case, you do not know enough about me. I didn't say all of your politics. But any of it. I think you would find, if you actually did some research, that you would agree on something, anything. Oh, but I think you would. I'm sure Ruth Davidson and I both agree that she should be allowed to marry who she wants and have a kid. And that's fine. Being a liberal does not make you in any way morally correct or just. She still hates the poor, Sean. The one thing, as Ewan calms down, the one point that I would like to finish on is going back to Meghan Markle, briefly. Um, we have discussed at length whether or not she should or should not be on the list and whether I or not... I think i she her, should be, actually. Yeah, and whether or not her having become a royal has helped her get there, which I think it probably has, because she has, by definition, gained a lot of influence. However, it is worth noting that Her Majesty the Queen is not on it. Um, I think... She would now in the preamble to the list, it does say that um, it. I will actually read the preamble out to you because it does name a few people regarding choices for the for the the article. For some, authority remains too precarious. Open brackets. Theresa May. Close brackets. For others, it's eternal. Open brackets. The Queen. Close brackets. So they have mentioned the Queen and Theresa May and who... Theresa May, who it has been noted in the media was not on the list. So you get to be on the list if you're a progressive right winger or a liberal, but if you're a political activist who stood for anything important uh, and opposed misogyny and racism throughout your entire career as an MP, we're you, talking about Diana. Di- yeah, now, yeah, you don't get to uh, you don't get a look in. You don't get mentioned. Interesting that one. You cynic. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening Thank to you this very episode much. of The Political Abyss. This rather heated episode of The Political Abyss. I've been Ewan. He's been Sean. I have. If you are a woman and actually have any kind of authority to talk about who uh, good role models for young women are, uh, let us know. Yes, please do. Please respond in some way. Email us at thepoliticalabyss at gmail.com or leave a comment on our website or Facebook page, www.thepoliticalabyss.com or facebook.com slash the political abyss it's so well rehearsed yeah, it's just know, so like smooth it. it's and we shall see you next sunday we shall all right fine jesus christ you